Hello, it's the ghost. Welcome to a dose of the real world, where truth is stranger than fiction, and things are not always as they seem. This episode is CERN scientist intentionally goes into black hole and ends up in an alternate dimension. A man is willing to do anything and go anywhere to find his wife, even if that means extreme and risky travel to a parallel universe. She was a scientist at CERN and went missing when her project went right. Take a listen and enjoy. What kind of job could involve CERN, a man and his wife who's gone missing? Well, one with a millionaire who has his eye on the prize, which is getting back to his wife who he hasn't seen in six years. His wife was a major scientist at CERN and led research into dark matter, black holes, and alternate dimensions, work and research that consumed her, literally. Now willing to do anything and go anywhere, this man is on a mission to find her, even if that means extreme and risky travel to a parallel universe. He's looking to the one and only witness to his wife's disappearance to help him and me to guide him through. The request I respond to here came to me in the usual way. The information I received was that this very wealthy man is looking to reconnect with his wife. He hasn't seen her in six years, and he will need assistance in getting to her. He tells me he's into big business and that any checks on him will show that he's good for whatever monetary fulfillment it will take to get this job done. He says he does have some inside help, but the journey is what he needs me for. First thing is that we check him out, right? He is a legendary commodities dealer who's also in the mining business. This guy is definitely for real and his big business in Switzerland. I clearly know he's good for the money, but what I'm really interested in is what he needs me for exactly. Harley's done her digging and what we know is that his wife went missing six years earlier. It was a high profile missing persons case that ran cold and unsolved. Stories ran around that she was taken and there was a demanded ransom. There was another story that she left him for a dealer in the United States, changed her name, and was gone forever. Another story went as far as to say that this man took out his wife because she was getting too involved in his business and was jeopardizing his company. There were a lot of stories, actually, but one stood out above the other dramatized hype tales, a story that we know had a little bit of truth to it. This man who, let's call him Lucas, Lucas with a K because he's Swiss. Anyway, this man lost his wife, Chloe, six years ago. We know this. But what we learn is that she was a scientist at CERN. And CERN, if you by chance do not know, conducts research and works to uncover what the universe is made of. They use high-powered accelerators to understand how the world was made. They study matter, energy, and a whole lot more. We learned that she was a successful scientist there, leading research into things like dark matter, black holes, and alternate dimensions. This little bit of information was the final pull for me to meet with this man. I have to think that something happened at CERN because even though there are a ton of people running conspiracies all over this thing, we also know that things do happen there. And if this is one of them, I want in. I'm meeting Lucas the next day, and it's anything but normal. But then again, this guy is anything but normal. Number one, he lives in Switzerland and works there. And we're meeting in Italy. Two, we're not meeting at a restaurant or hotel or anywhere like that. We're set to meet on his yacht. Our meeting is set for the evening. And when Harley and I get to the marina, there's a man that meets us. And they take us down to the yacht where Lucas comes down to introduce himself. And he's just what I expected and exactly like the pictures we have on him. You know, he's dapper, smooth, well-mannered, just everything polished you would think a guy like this would be. We get moving, and I can tell he's a little distracted and deep in thought, which makes sense. And when he gets into it, you could just feel how heavy the situation is. But there's also this crazy feeling of excitement. I just know that whatever he has to say is going to be something big. And it turns out, it is. So he starts out by going over some of the history with his wife. She had beaten cancer. They never had children, although they tried. You know, things like that. He told us how supportive she was, how he loved her. You could tell they were very different, but he cared for her deeply. His work was high stress, financially driven, and fast moving. Where her work was her passion. It was exciting, groundbreaking. 
You know, for her, every day was a new day, waiting for breakthroughs, working to make miracles happen, and reach an understanding about our world and the universe. And so after he tells us about all of that, he starts to get to the big stuff. His wife did disappear, but no, there was no ransom. No, his wife didn't leave him and run to the U.S., and no, he did not take her out. His tone changes, and he got very serious when he told us what really happened. Chloe was at work with her assistant, more like her partner in crime, when she disappeared. She was working a top-priority experiment in project advancement. According to Lucas, these kinds of projects at CERN are not ones that are always publicized. Chloe's project here was black holes, and not many people knew about it, although their work on black holes was getting out in bits. They were successful in getting them to work at a smaller level, but to go big was raising public concerns. The conspiracies about man-made black holes swallowing up our planet, or creating earthquakes, or even allowing the devil to come in and take over, fueled the need for these secret ops at CERN. And that was Chloe's team. Her projects were run underneath the LHC. That's the Large Hadron Collider to you and me. They had another entire lab down there where these projects were run. That lab was where Chloe went every day and would sometimes actually stay for a couple of days at a time. According to her assistant, Chloe had mapped out the black hole, ran test after test, and she wanted to go in. She was convinced that this black hole was a path to an alternate dimension, one parallel to our own. She said it was slightly into the future. She thought about five years, but wasn't sure, but she wanted to know. If she made it in, she wanted to study not only the inner workings of black holes, but life on the other side. I mean, how many lives could we be leading at a time? How many alternate dimensions could there be? Could she travel to them? And another biggie, is it possible to retain thoughts and memories for more than one? According to Lucas, Chloe believed that things like deja vus and the premonitions people have are not what we think they are at all, but instead they are actually memories from another dimension, a parallel universe. And she wanted to get to one through her black hole and prove her theory. She wanted to find out the truth and find out what the purpose of any of it was. Was the Big Bang just one of many in a space trying to achieve perfection? Were we simply in one petri dish of many? Now, Harley and I are listening to Lucas and we're taking all this in and it's a lot, but I can respect it. I mean, I'm not blind to the fact that there is much more to our scientists and their research than we're ever going to learn from a magazine or a web posting or even the news. Scientists are always steps ahead of us, which is no surprise, but that doesn't mean I know all about it either. So again, we're on this yacht talking and then there's another guy that comes aboard. It's Nico. This is Chloe's assistant, and this is great because I really need to talk to this guy. I mean, here we are talking about Chloe going missing at the CERN, and he's here. Yeah, I definitely want to talk to him. I'm all excited to hear what he has to say, but he comes aboard, and I can tell he's irritated. Apparently, there's a professor at a university there that's causing all kinds of problems. I just look at Harley, and I'm waiting for more information. Nico sees us, and then he apologizes, and when I ask what's going on, we're introduced, and Lucas gives us the scoop. So there's this professor. He's been very loud and involved with the protests against black hole experiments. Lucas says that this professor has been on him since about six months after Chloe disappeared. He's been able to keep him at bay for a while, but he just won't go away. He is convinced there's more to the story, which there is, but Lucas doesn't want to give any of it up. Nico's not going to talk, and certainly no one at the CERN is. And this is all good to know because I don't want this guy in our way, but right now I really want to hear from Nico and find out what exactly happened the day Chloe went missing. So we all sit down in the couch sort of lounge area of the yacht, and Nico gets into it. It was a Friday night, but Chloe was so close to her goal, and things were happening, and she just couldn't stop working. She laid out a map for Nico and told him it would all be okay, but basically... She wanted to go into this black hole that she created because apparently she said it was stable or ready, you know, whatever she needed, and she wanted to go in. Nico was the only one there, and he didn't really love the idea, but they did have a plan, and they even had a backup plan. Chloe was to go in, and she was extremely clear that she would only have 12 hours to get back. That would be six hours in our dimension, so six hours for Nico. She needed Nico to wait there, observe, record behaviors, any readings, any changes, um, and wait for her to come back out. 
if she missed the window, he was to shut down the black hole and just tell everyone that she had left her home the night before and leave it at that. Well, she never did come out, and Nico did what he was told. He didn't tell anyone what really happened, except for Lucas, because Chloe was clear that she wanted him to know the truth. She wanted him to trust that she knew what she was doing, that she would be okay, and he could decide what he wanted to do next. So, wow, we have a missing scientist who went into a black hole and never came out. No one knows the full extent of her scientific progress, and no one knows what really happened except for Nico. And then there was Lucas. He didn't know what to do with the information. But what he did want to do was open this dimension hole, as he called it, and get her out of there. And that's why we were all there that day, to discuss a plan, firm up plan, so that he could go in and get her. But Nico had some unfortunate news. Chloe could not come back. He tried over and over again after she went missing to open it all back up for her, but he found that her research was correct. Once the 12 hours was up, there was no way back. We could move forward on getting there, but Lucas would have to decide, one, if he wanted to do this at all, two, if he could leave there without her and with whatever knowledge he found there, or three, he could stay there. Well, Lucas wanted to go no matter what, and he felt he would know what to do when he got there. So now the mission was to get him there. After that, we would leave, and it would be his choice. So there it was. I mean, we have the job, but it's a risky one. How do we prepare? Where will we end up anyway on the other side? Where do we come out? And really, we have no idea what to expect. The worlds are parallel, but not exact. This job is a crazy, mysterious, and dangerous mess. And that's perfect for me. I agree to take the job, and we're off. Okay, so our little evening on the boat was a little shocking, but we ended on a good note. Next, we will need to meet at CERN, which requires a small bit of travel. And then we need to get in, which can be tricky, but Nico has it all figured out. They have some educational things there, small things open to the public, events and just different things. They even have some of Hollywood's elite that have been able to go there. But this would have to be a special circumstance. We are able to get in with a pass as writers and researchers working for Lucas on Chloe's biography. They are won over by the thought of us putting CERN in a positive light, and so it's approved. We have one week. It will be me, Frankie, and Harley that will be going in. Jagger and Ryder are to stay back for now and hold down the hotel fort. This first visit is really for orientation. Nico also has a lot of documentation for us to read over about what Chloe was working on and what progress she was making. On top of her official logs, she also kept a private journal of progress on her lab as well. Information only to be used if she came out a winner because a lot of her work wasn't even shared with the people who approved her projects. We were really into the top secret stuff of top secret projects. When we left that afternoon, we were headed to Lucas's estate. But before we could get very far, we were stopped. It was the professor. He told us he'd been watching Lucas and Nico and that he'd never met us before. He didn't know that we knew who he was, so we played along, telling him that we were working with Lucas, doing a full biography on the life of Chloe and her work at CERN. This throws him off a bit, and he's a little confused, so we sort of just take advantage of that and talk and scramble our way out of there. Now I need Jagger. He has a new target to watch and keep track of, so I send him to task. I need to know where this guy is at all times and what he's doing. In the meantime, we get to work. For two days, we get to know Chloe and her project, Nico and Lucas. These are all very busy people. Now, Lucas was out of town for two weeks before this all happened. He flew in that Friday. She was at the lab that Friday night, and they were going to spend the Saturday evening together because it was their wedding anniversary. When it was getting late on Friday night, Lucas was calling the lab, but he only got Nico who told him that she was in the middle of her big experiment and she couldn't talk, and then he had to go. Lucas knew that she was on the edge of this big black hole testing, and he didn't want her to go through with it. Even with him being away, they talked every night, and his biggest fear was that she would go through with this and that this very thing would happen. She, of course, assured him that it wouldn't, but here we are. We're getting into all of this stuff when we're suddenly interrupted by a delivery. It's a letter stating the intent of the professor to gain access to Chloe's private notes. The investigation of her disappearance is still underway in the Court of Human Rights, and he doesn't trust what we are doing there. There's a lot to it, but basically, they're one step closer to finding out the truth. 
in a way, all the stories that have been going around about how she disappeared have helped Lucas because it kept a diversion out there and kept people on different tracks. Us showing up, though, has thrown up a flag that something suspicious is going on. Nothing's happening yet, but it's a good warning and a notice that we need to move fast. So we bump things up a bit and we head back to the lab. I also get wind from Jagger that our professor is spending a lot of time at that courthouse and around CERN. None of this is good. But there are two things. I mean, can they really prove that Chloe disappeared into the unknown? No, they can't. Can they halt our access and dig deeper? Sure. And if they get enough evidence, that could stop Nico's work in the underground lab. And then we may never get to Chloe. This mission is my job, and I'm not going to let any of this other stuff get in my way. We head back to CERN, and I don't plan on coming back out until I have this completed. Now, Chloe worked down in a level under the LHC, so that's where we go. We go into this big blocked off area, and we have to go through lots of little hallways, and we pass lab areas and some big stuff until we get to the back. That's where Nico and Chloe worked. This place is crazy. It's not like any lab I've ever seen. And there are people at CERN 24-7, but there's no one down in the special ops at this hour. It's like 2 in the morning. There are huge tubes, gold wires coming out everywhere, hissing sounds. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. And anyway, we get to the backspace when Nico turns on the lights. And it's like we enter a whole different world. There's foiled piping and big machines and what looks like a big bank vault in the back. Nico flips on a bunch of computer gadgets and things and then walks over to the big circle door in the back. That is where he last saw Chloe. He shows us all of that and then we go over the plans left by Chloe, what she went over with Nico before she went in. And according to what she shared, here's what we know. You have to wear a protective suit. Things that you take with you to the other side may not function. Things like phones, obviously, but other electronics and even guns, for example. All technology is slightly different there. To get there, it's not a straight shot, and you have to travel a ways to make it to the other side, and it can get messy. You don't enter into the same location at CERN, so leaving the lab doesn't put you at the lab. It puts you at a random location, fairly close, but not exact, and never the same each time. And there is a one-time 12-hour window to get back. That's how long the hole will stay open, and... It only has the ability to suck back in the matter that went through. It will never take anything new. So Chloe, for instance, has no way of coming back. Lucas could, but he has made the decision at this point that if all goes well, he will go in, but he will not come back with us. Okay, I will be taking Harley and Frankie with me. And although Lucas is choosing to stay there, I have all intentions of coming back. So I know I have 12 hours to get Lucas across, find Chloe, hope all is good, and come back. That will be Lucas's last chance to change his mind. But Lucas tells me he won't change his mind. And I get a notice that, sure enough, he has sent final payment to me. Even though the job's not done, he tells me he knows it's a risk. And I'm doing my part all the same. And he wants to get it to me in case he can't get it to me later. And that's the last of it before we go. I mean, there was a ton going on. There was a lot to know, a lot to learn. And I really could go on forever about this job. But I'm telling you this in a vlog. So I don't want to take up hours of your time telling you what happened here. Okay, so we brought everything we might need to the lab. And Nico has everything that we need to get through. So we don't waste any time. We get all geared up, and just so you know what that's like, what it was for, like for me, I'm in some good you know, weather gear, thin stuff that will keep me warm at some pretty low temperatures because I don't know what I'm getting into. And I want the clothes tighter so they don't have fabric flapping all around because I don't have any idea where I'm going to be. I don't want to get stuck on anything, and I really don't want to be seen either. So I'm wearing all black. Oh, and if I didn't tell you, we're going to be crossing over into the night hours of wherever it is we're going, so... That'll help us have less of a chance of being seen in the first place. I have a backpack on, and that has some things that I might need on the other side, as well as some things that Nico gave me. He explains them to me, and he really just hopes I don't need them. I have my sparkly silver black hole suit on, and this thing is, it's kind of like, it's made of fabric, but then again, it's kind of like stretchy rubber. It's very durable. I mean, I should be able to make it through anything with this thing on. It covers me from head to toe, and I basically have my own atmosphere in it. 
And that's run by another pack that will run across my shoulders on top of the suit. So my face is covered. It's, it's everywhere. The atmosphere pack is a smart pack. And the first chamber we will get to in the tunnel will change out the system from the Earth's regular oxygen levels and things to what it predicts we will find on the other side. We can take the suits off when we get there, and the pack has a memory, and it will set us up for our return, as long as it's within the 12 hours. Now, this all seems to be fairly simple, but I'm thinking it just can't be that easy. There has to be a catch. And sure enough, Nico has more to say. He says that when we're passing through, because we're moving times, places, into a new reality, things can get skewed. And he compared it to dreaming, as if you were in a dream, but you knew you were dreaming. I know I've had that, and it's weird. So you sort of know what's happening, but there's nothing you can do about it. And with this, something could actually be happening to you. These dreams or visions can actually hurt you. Whatever haunts you, scares you, or is a threat to you here in your reality could be a part of the hallucinations and skewed reality that we might see. We have to try to not engage in any of this. And if by chance we do, we have to come out the winner because otherwise what happens in the tunnel stays in the tunnel for eternity. He told us about one of Chloe's other partners that decided to go through. He was a scientist, but he sort of went crazy and decided to pull a solo move one night. Chloe figured it out and tried to stop him but got there just as he went in. She tracked him as far as she could, but then his trail stopped. He stopped. He never made it through, and he never made it back, and he would never come out. Nico also said that we might see this person, and if we do not to be fooled by any of his cries for help, it would be a trick. Any part of this guy's right mind that he had at one time on earth would be no longer. His thoughts and words will be of some other untrustworthy source. I kind of got the sense from Nico that he had a healthy respect for all the religious warnings of the devil seeping his way through the black holes. He definitely didn't trust it. So then it's time. We're suited up. We have our warnings. And the four of us are ready to go through. If we want to turn around, we have to do it before the first chamber. And Nico reminds us of our 12-hour window. And then he opens the big round vault-like door. And we look inside, and inside it's blue smoke, lots of black, and this metal walkway. We go in, and then we sort of all freeze when the heavy door slams shut behind us. It's very dark, but there are some little blue lights showing us our track and providing us with a little bit of a view. We have special headlamps also. We go a ways, and literally there's nothing. It's just the walkway and us. The suits are easy to move in, so that's good, and we just make our way single file. It's Frankie first, then it's Lucas, me, and Harley's holding up the back. We get to the chamber. It's got a door, and we go in, and there's benches, and then there's another door on the other side to go out the other side. We get in, and we shut the door behind us, as instructed, and we each hook up our suits to the chamber, like Nico told us to do, and we wait. Our suits are preparing for the other side. They're readjusting settings for pressure, gravity changes, things like that. I have to admit, I sort of feel like I'm an astronaut, about ready to go into space, but that little fantasy doesn't last long, because we finish up and we're about to walk out the other side. So we unplug, we make sure we're set, and we go forward. Frankie opens the door to the other side, and immediately, it's different. There was CERN electricity lighting the way in, but now it's as if we're somewhere else, which makes sense. We can only rely on our headlamps now and any other light supplies that we brought with us to see where we are. Frankie even wore a video device, like a belt around his chest, but the lights on that go out the minute the door opens, so that's not going to work. All we can do is head forward, and I'm keeping my eye on Lucas as we go. Our metal walkway's gone, so now we just have this sand, rock, sort of stone ground under our feet. It's not like anything I've seen before. It's all black. Anyway, we're making our way, and I'd say we'd been going about 15 minutes when Lucas screams out. He startles everyone, and he's calling, no, no. Then he stops, and he's just looking at something, something none of the rest of us can see. I shine my light on him, and he's just frozen, like he's fearful. And then with my handheld light shining on his face, I can see a single tear trickle down his right cheek. What was weird about all of that is that I didn't even notice myself slipping. I was slipping off into la-la land, basically, while I was observing Lucas. When I turn away from him, I can't see Harley behind me anymore. It's like she disappeared. When I call her name, it was all silent. And then the bats came. 
There were big bats, and I mean bigger than any bat I've ever seen. They're flying all around me. I duck down on one knee, and these things are flying above me. They're even flying into me. And I just try to keep holding on to the fact that this is all part of what Nico said, and not to engage. I mean, it seems to go on for what seems like a while. And then suddenly it's Harley, not Bats, patting me on the back and getting my attention. She's calling out to me, you know, and at first her voice is distant, but then I can hear her clearly and I snap out of it. And when I do, I find Lucas on the ground and he's bleeding from his forehead. Frankie's there, but has no idea what hit him. The place was definitely creepy. And I can't tell you how far we'd gone. I had no idea how far we still had to go. The whole thing was very weird. You know, I thought I'd be worried about breathing and gravity and things like that, but it was more about your mind. I mean, Harley started crying and screaming for help, and it took all we had to hold her back from running off. Frankie ended up staring ahead, and he wouldn't move. And because we had no idea what was happening, what he was seeing, we all just had to wait and do our best to hold on to our own senses. Later, we found out it was the lost scientist. It had gotten to Frankie, and it was trying to turn us around and go back to the lab and take him with us. Frankie was just standing there, trying his hardest to hold on to the reality he knew. And he almost fell for it. But in the end, he was strong. And he stood stone-faced in front of it all and just refused to believe. Lucas had a few more iffy moments as well. He thought he saw his wife and she was telling him to go back. Of course, he believed it. We had to keep him moving. The terrain got harder too. So instead of walking across, we were now climbing. Up and up we had to go. We were getting tired. We were getting nervous about our oxygen. Just all of that paired with all the weird visions and hallucinations. It seemed like, well, honestly, it seemed like it took us a few days to get through, but we did eventually. We knew we were there because there was another door to another chamber, just like Nico said. Inside, we were to take off our suits and leave them there. We got all our stuff situated, and then we crawled up and out of this big hole. The chamber door closes behind us, so we're up and out of there. Nico gave each of us these wrist clocks, so we set them for 12 hours and they start to count down. We need to get out and figure out where we are before we can even put a real plan in place. So we start walking around and remember, it's nighttime. We get up on the hillside and we can see it. We can see the lights of CERN. We can see the airport, the small areas all around it. I mean, it would be so great to have been able to explore where the world was at in this dimension, but we're here for Lucas and we need to find Chloe. He can only think of two places she would be because in her other life, there were only two places she would have been, home or CERN. So we start to head to their house. We know there would have been a huge risk of Chloe finding her future self here, and we have no idea what she would have done about that or what might have happened, but we have to start somewhere. We can see that we're many years ahead of where we thought we were. The cars are cars, but not really all the buildings seem to be made of some material and they all look to be white or gray. It's pretty weird. We sneak our way onto this train thing and then we walk a ways and we make our way over to their house. It's about 5 30 in the morning so we hope we don't have to wait long and it turns out we don't. We get our break when a dog is let out at six in the morning. A woman steps out and is in a robe and while her dog runs around and does his business in the grass she takes a seat on one of the patio chairs, sets her coffee down and lights up a smoke. They have a good sized lawn and their house is on a hill and we've just been waiting for some lights to come on and hiding in the bushes. We're all just sitting there watching this woman. From the house lights we can see she's in a white silk robe. She's trim. She has long nails. She has long blondish almost white hair. I mean it looks like it could be Chloe but she's a little bit different. The woman is just sitting there and slowly smoking this cigarette. But Lucas he's in awe. He tells me it's her. Before we can even think of what we should do or make sure it's the right her, he gets up and calls her name. There's no going back now. We can't pull him back in like he wasn't there. We just hope she doesn't panic and think he's a stranger, even though we have no idea what year it is and he could very well be a stranger to her at this point, even if it is the right Chloe. The woman stands up. She doesn't say anything at first, but then she says his name. She knows who it is. She puts down her smoke and he keeps walking until they're standing basically face to face on this patio. We start to come out of the bushes also and he tells her it's fine and that we came under Nico's direction from CERN. They hug. She tells us to all come with her and we all go inside. Now, none of us can know what's going to happen and I'm just keeping my eye on the countdown clock. 
We go inside, and I mean, this whole big reunion happens. She's tending to the wound on Lucas's forehead. They're laughing and crying and all that stuff. And all of it's great, but my job is to make sure things are secure, and we need to get down to business. And what we get is a crazy story. For one, Chloe never met her future self. The Chloe in this dimension died in childbirth. She was with the Lucas of this parallel universe, but he was no longer there either. After his Chloe died and the new Chloe showed up, he tried to make it work, and she even got pregnant successfully, which shocked her because in her old life she couldn't. They had a child, a girl, and they named her Elena. But in the end, he missed his Chloe, and he couldn't take it, and he committed suicide. And so now, here she was, with Elena. She had worked her way back into CERN, so she was both happy and depressed, understandably. When we ask about the professor, we found out that he's the one missing now, and no one's seen him in four years. Again, there are a lot of stories just like when she went missing, but nobody really knows. Now, Chloe and Lucas have some things to talk over and figure out, and they have very little time to do it. So the rest of us, were just waiting it out with urgency in the air. In the end, like Lucas planned, he's going to stay back with his Chloe and figure things out. All he said to me was that he didn't know what it meant or what would happen, but that it was better than being back where he came from without his wife and without knowing if she was okay, all that stuff. I mean, I would have loved to have stuck around and seen how this all played out, but I don't have time. This is done and that's that. And me and my team, we need to head back. We only have six hours. So Lucas is going to stay, but he's going to help and drive us close to our exit spot to save on time. But on our way, we end up surrounded. And it's the professor, and he brought others. Somehow, he figured out something was going on. How, at this point, we don't know. But we're surrounded, and there's some pretty big guys getting out of the cars. They pull us out of our vehicle, but they leave Lucas where he is. The professor's angry, but somehow he's also laughing. It's like an evil laugh. He walks up to me and says, he's learned about me. He also said the CERN lies, and he's vowed to never stop searching for the truth. This man's clearly obsessed. And now he sees Lucas here after his suicide, and that really has him going. But right then, I remember something that Nico told me, something he gave me. So I just go along with what the professor says to keep him calm, and then I tell him I have something for him that I knew I would run into him, and it's something he should see. I'm scanned for weapons, of which I have none, and he goes for it. I break out a small booklet, and inside it are digital photos. Nico put it together, and it's filled with photos of the professor's life on the other side. I start to flip through it for him. Some of the earlier pictures match his life here, and they do nothing. But then something starts to change. In this world, it's later, and supposedly he's disappeared or went into hiding, But on the other side where we're from, he has not disappeared and probably won't as far as I can tell. And I show him pictures of his studies and his successes back in our world. Remember, our worlds are parallel, but they're not exact. This all shows him a different life, a different professor, a professor who left his obsession with Chloe a long time ago. And as Nico predicted, these photos, this proof of another reality, puts the professor into shock. He grabs the book from me, and he tells his men to stand down. He literally goes temporarily mad. I pry the booklet out of his hands, and we slowly get back into our car with Lucas, and we drive away. The professor and his men are just left standing there. It will take the professor a little while to figure it all out. He's now going to have to deal with what this all is, and it may throw his life into a bit of a spiral, but at the same time, it could lead him into great things. Whatever happens, all has to be left behind on this side. We need to get back. We make it to our entrance hole, and before we climb our way down, we say our goodbyes to Lucas. It's a little bittersweet, but we do have to go. Our little countdown clocks are set up with the ability to communicate with the door. It knows we're back on time, and it's ready for us to enter. Now, if we would have missed our time, this door would not have opened. It, in fact, wouldn't even have been there at all. And There never would be a door in that location again. We go in, and we go through our process, a little more ready for the dark and smoky tunnel this time, although the hallucinations and visions are just as vicious. I mean, Frankie's attacked again by something no one can see. Harley ends up in a ball crying off to the side. I ignore my bat problem, but then end up being stalked by this big black beast. It's got glowing eyes, and it's roaring so loud I have to cover my ears. 
I'm doing my best to hold on to the small bit of reality I can remember, and we all just try to eke our way forward the best we can. It feels like it takes forever, but then we finally hit our door. We scan our countdown clocks, and it opens. We made it. When we get to the lab, we find Nico, and he's looking pretty disheveled. He tracked us as far as he could going in, and then for him, he was blind to anything we were doing or where we were until his scanners picked us back up again on the way back. There was nothing but shock and relief in that room. Nico was glad we were back and had a ton of questions. We were all just stunned, and we needed to come down from it all. I gave Nico his stuff back, and we put the book on his desk. I told him his theory was right, that we did see the professor, and that the book did exactly what he thought it would do. The book was how we got out. The end of this job went really fast, actually. Our passes at CERN were about to end. Nico had started his own set of private notes, and he would just go on to continue his work where Chloe left off. The CERN people thought the book idea was great, but in all honesty, these guys, these scientists from all over the world, they don't care about some book. They wouldn't even know if the book was ever published. We did see the professor one more time, for a brief moment. And it seemed he might have accepted the book idea, and he wanted to interview us. I told him that maybe we would do it the next week, but of course, by then, we were gone. With a place like CERN, will we ever really know what's going on there? Like the stories about Chloe's disappearance, you know, all those theories and good-for-the-paper stories that kept people busy and distracted. It kept him not concerned about what really was going on, except for the professor, I guess. But anyway, it's the same for CERN, with all the fun stories and conspiracy theories out there. Who really is asking the hard questions? Who really wants to know? As for me and my team, we learned plenty on that job, and it was enough. For us, it was fly back home and see what was waiting for us. Every now and then, though, Chloe and Lucas do pop into my head. I wonder what they're up to and how their daughter is. I wonder about the white and gray buildings and the crazy cars. But then I realized that surely people have been to our dimension, they've visited us, that we have been an alternate reality for them. And then my head starts to spin, so I just move on. You know, next job, here I come. And that was client number 79, and my job behind the scenes at CERN, witnessing a black hole and another dimension. Very crazy stuff. I hope you enjoyed this vlog, and I hope you check back for more. And subscribe so you know when I post next. And thank you for listening. And until next time. And I will talk to you all soon. And okay, that's a wrap. See you all next time.